I have to excuse me this morning, I'm a little bit unbalanced. <coughs> you see, that the heading of the sermon is, Thou shalt surely die. And the scripture, reading from Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, has those words in it. Now, though this is not a very pleasant subject, it is of great importance to us. We need to know what God requires of us so that we can receive the promise of eternal life. Now, God through the Bible reveals what He requires of man, but also through the Bible, God reveals what we can expect of Him. Now, God does not have a hidden agenda. We are told exactly what God, what we can expect from God. Now, we have scriptures talking about Jesus coming, being fulfilled exactly as they presented to us. And of course, we realize that Jesus was the seed that was promised to Abraham. And we know that if we make a commitment to do what the Lord requires of us to do, that we can have the promise of eternal life. And that's really what our goal should be. Because we know that when you talk about everlasting life, it's forever. There's no cut-off date like we have in our lives today. We might live to 50, 60, 70, we may even touch 100 or over. But it ends. This life is going to end. Now, Adam and Eve understood that they were not to eat of the fruit of that tree. Because when Satan came to me, he asked him, what did God say? And they repeated exactly what God said. In Genesis 2, verse 17, it says, If you eat it, you shall surely die. Now, when Adam and uh, Eve ate of the fruit, they actually violated God's law. And when you violate God's law, you are guilty of sin. To be guilty of sin means that you are separated from God. This in turn means that you sever your relationship with God. Now in Romans, we had uh, one scripture read here this morning, but in Romans uh, chapter 3 verse 10, Paul says, There is none righteous, no, not one. And then he goes on in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, he says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we realize that each one of us are subject to the law of sin. We, each one of us have violated God's law and therefore we have separated ourselves from God. But like I mentioned, Christ came so that we can be reunited uh, with Him if we make a commitment to obey Him and to do His will. We have all violated the law and we've separated ourselves from God. Violation of God's law subjects you, as I said, to the penalty of it. Now, why do we violate God's law? What's the reason for this? Well, in James chapter 1 and verse 14, he says, You are drawn away by your own lust and enticed. Adam and Eve were enticed by the fruit of that tree and by what Satan said. Although God said you shall die, Satan said you won't die, you'll be like God. So they listened to Satan, order and they fulfilled their desires. And this is exactly what happens to us in this life today, no different. There's things out there in the world that draw our attention and it draws it to such a point that we decide to go for it no matter what the scriptures say. We're warned about uh, getting involved in certain things that are going to take us down a path of sin, but we say, well, I can handle it. We can't handle anything. God knows it, and that's why He has given us all these scriptures that we can read and learn what He requires of us that we can stand up against the wiles of the devil. Now, we're enticed by our desires for the things of this life. And you know, it's like a fish swimming there in the water and it sees this food there floating around. He goes for it. Well, why? He doesn't see the danger. He doesn't see the hook there that's going to catch him. And we are like that. We see what we want to see in this world, but the Lord sees beyond that. And therefore, He warns us of these things that we're going to face in this life. He warns us of the dangers that are there. And therefore, if we heed His warning, then many of us will not get into the strife and the heartache that so many people get into because of their lack of knowledge and lack of commitment and lack of understanding and lack of trusting the Lord to lead them through this life. Now what does God say concerning sin? Well, go with me to uh, Genesis chapter 6. In Genesis chapter 6, we read verses 5 to 7. Notice it says, For Jonah saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented Jehovah that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. 
And Jonah said, I will destroy man from whom I have created on the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and birds of the heavens, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But I just want to read to you verse 8. It says, But Noah found favor in the eyes of Jehovah. Now it grieves hard, it grieves God to his heart when we sin. You know, we must realize that, that it's not something God takes lightly. But God brought judgment upon those that had turned from him in that world back there. And if you look at verse 9 of Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 6, it says, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man and perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. Now that's what we've got to do. We understand this language when we say you walk with somebody, you have this relationship, this association, and it's a close one that you have. And this is what Noah had. Noah followed God's instructions, and he was saved on certain death. But you know, not only was he saved, but his influence to his family caused them to be saved as well, too, because they all got into the ark with Noah. But go with me to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 6. Look at Proverbs chapter 6 and uh, from verse uh, 16. Notice what it says. It says, there are six things which Jehovah hated. Now these are things that it says that God hates. Now notice what they are. He says, yea, seven, which are an abomination unto him. What he eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that, are, uh, that shed innocent blood, a heart that divides with wicked purposes, feet that are swift and running to mischief, a false witness, that utters lies, and he that sows discord among the brethren. My son, keep the commandment of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thy heart. Tie them about thy neck. When thou walkest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall watch over thee. And when thou wakest, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment of is a lamp, and the law is light. And the reproofs and instructions are a way of life. The Old Testament teaches us lessons. And one of the main lessons it teaches us is that God hates sin. God doesn't hate the individual that sins. That's why he sent his son. But he hates sin. What sin does and of course the direction that sin sends us in. God brought the judgment upon the world in that day because of their sin. And you can imagine how many people suffered that terrible death of drowning when those waters rose up. But go with me to Matthew. Matthew chapter 10 and verse uh, 28. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28. Look at Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28, I think. This is what it says. It says, And be not afraid of them that kill the body, but are not able to kill a soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now we should fear God, and the reason is he's almighty, he is the one that is going to have the last say uh, in our lives. And we demonstrate our respect for God by learning his word and obeying the gospel. This is to fear God, to learn to respect him to the point that you're going to do exactly as he instructs you to do. Now, God's desire for man is to be saved. But if we do not obey him, then as we have just read here in Matthew 10, verse 28, he says he will destroy both soul and body in hell. Eternal separation he's talking about here. And we understand the language that the Bible uses when it talks about heaven, it talks about gold and pearls and stuff that we, uh, we, we realize that we aspire to. When it talks about hell, it talks about fire or outer darkness or gnashing of teeth. Something that you don't want to get involved in. We understand this and therefore we need to take heed how we walk in this life because we are going to land up in one of the two places. Heaven or hell. The choice is ours. Now the actions and attitudes, our actions and our attitudes reveal our respect or disrespect for God. Now I want to go to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28. I'm going to read verse 1 and verse 15. God presents the Jews with two promises here. And of course, we know as we go through history, we find both these promises came to fruition. But look at verse 1 firstly. 
It says, Deuteronomy 28 verse 1, he says, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of Jehovah thy God, to observe to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that Jehovah thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth. And so he goes forth, right up to verse 14, and he presents the, the promises of blessing that they would receive. Okay? But you know, he uses a word there, if, in that verse 1. And that's a big word, it means conditional, okay? And of course, if they were prepared to obey him. But in verse 15, this is the other side of the coin. Look at verse 15. He says, But it shall come to pass, if thou would not hearken unto the voice of Jehovah thy God, to observe to do all his commandments, and his statutes which I command thee this day, that thou, these curses shall come upon thee, and overtake thee. And then he spells them out as you continue reading them. But there again is that word, if. So, they had a choice given to them. Serve God, do His will, and they would be blessed. And you know, as we look at their history, we find the Jews being blessed when they serve God. When they turn from Him, we find them being brought down. Okay? And of course, we realize finally at the end, when Jesus came on the scene, they had gotten so bad that they actually rejected Him. Rejected Him as their King. They were waiting for the Messiah to come. And He had to come in the times of Rome. Okay? And there are so many scriptures that reveal when Jesus would come, how He would come, all of these things are there. We have a picture of Jesus, you might say. And yet here we have these people turning against him and of course hand him over to Rome to be crucified. And of course, what did the high priest say? Let his blood be upon our hands and our children. And of course, we know in AD 70, that came to fruition. Rome came upon Jerusalem and destroyed the temple and killed many thousands of Jews. But also, we realize that God's love was there still, that if we are prepared to turn to Him, we can escape this severe condemnation that can be brought upon these people, or that was brought upon these people. Now, ultimately, as I say, this curse came upon them, as we see in them rejecting Jesus. And in Luke chapter 13 and verse 27, notice here it says, Jesus said, Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. They had no authority for what they were teaching back here. The people were teaching what they wanted. We know, as we study the book of uh, Galatians, we know that people were coming in and they were adding things to the gospel. And of course, to try and get their way, they were trying to tell us that uh, Paul was not an apostle. And of course, as we study the book, we realize just how important it is for us to realize that Paul was an apostle, and an apostle is one that sent. And this man, Paul, was sent by Jesus Christ, okay, to preach the gospel as the other apostles were. Now in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, it says, the word is living and active. In other words, it will achieve the goal that God has set it to achieve. It discerns the, the, the thoughts and the intent of the heart. In other words, God knows our very thoughts. Just like I said, God knows the future before it even happens. We see this in the Bible, like I mentioned. We have things told us that are going to happen in the future. And it's not something that could have happened this way or could happen. We have intimate knowledge of what's going to take place. And it happened exactly as God said it would take place. If you want to go with me to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, I want to read verse 18. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 18, he says, Being darkened in their understanding and alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardening of their heart. Now, you notice here, he says that they hardened their hearts. This is talking actually about the Gentiles here. They hardened their hearts and God rejected them. God rejected them. And you know, a picture comes to mind of a man by the name of Pharaoh, most powerful man in the world at the time, the most powerful nation he ruled over. They ruled the world, you might say. And yet, here comes this man, Moses, and tells him that God wants him to release his people. He couldn't accept this. Well, you could accept maybe him opposing it after the first and second uh, plague that came upon him. But you know, when it got to the seventh or eighth plague, you would have thought he would have come to the realization that he's faced with something here that he cannot fight. But you know, he still stood there. And of course, on the tenth plague, he released the people. But he didn't release them because he wanted to now get rid of them. He released them because of the pain and suffering and heartache he had gone through with the tenth plague. The firstborn died in every home that did not have the blood on the doorposts and the lintels. 
So he releases them. But they're no sooner gone and he wants them back. So he chases after them and he loses a large part of his army in the sea because he thought that he could oppose God. Now, we don't want to be like that. We want to learn God's word and not be one that actually stands against it. Now, Jesus came as our Savior to forgive our sins. In 1 John, if you want to go to 1 John with me, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. Look at this, it says, it says, My little children, these things write I unto ye, that he may not sin. And if a man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So Jesus is our advocate, he said. And we all understand what an advocate does. He, in, he intercedes for us. He pleads our case. Jesus sits on the right hand of the Father. He has God's ear, you might say. And he actually pleads our case to the Father. And in verse 3 of that same book, of that same chapter, it says, And hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Now notice that. He said, we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Now to keep his commandments means that we're doing his will. Why? Because he has promised us eternal life. So therefore we prepare to make this commitment to Christ that we can have uh, eternal life. Now in 1 Peter, you want to go with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. I'm going to read verse 24. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. It says, Who his own self, sorry, who his own self bear our sins in his body upon the tree, that, that we having died unto sins might live unto righteousness by whose stripes he were healed. Now Jesus paid our debt of sin, and he has, 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 has sacrificed himself for you and for me. And of course in James chapter 2, if you just want to go with me to James chapter 2, I'm going to read verse 20 and 21. Notice what it says here. It says, But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith apart from works is barren? Was not Abraham our father justified by works, and that he offered up Isaac, his son, upon the altar? Now here we, we talk about Abraham. So he talks about faith apart from works is barren. It's useless. Your works actually reveals your faith. And the example of Abram that's presented to us over here is a very clear example. We know Abram had a promise made to him. In fact, he had three promises made to him in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. Verse 1 and 2 was a land promise and a nation promise, and verse 3 was a seed promise. And that seed is Christ, okay? Now you can imagine here, God tells Abram, take your son on that mountain and offer him as a sacrifice. And Abram takes him up there, he doesn't argue with God, he doesn't try and... I uh, uh, think that he could do this way or that way. He does exactly what God tells him to do. And he's about to strike down into the sun. The only son that was promised to him is Sarah. Sarah could not have a child. She was 91 years of age when she had uh, Isaac. And here now, Abram is about to kill him. The one through whom all his promises are coming. He's prepared to kill him. And he's about to strike down and God stops him. He said, now I know. Now I believe that God didn't say that for his benefit, he told, said that for our benefit. So that when we do exactly as God tells us, then God knows and we know where we stand. We know we're serving God and that we are committed to doing his will. So if we take Abram's example and we are prepared to do, and we don't have to offer our children, we're not told to do that, we are told certain things in the New Testament to serve God and we are prepared to do it, then we will receive the promises of eternal life. Now in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8 it says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. As I said, the Bible says that each and every one of us has sin. And that's why Christ is so important to us. Now we can claim to be righteous, but God knows our every thought. He knows what we're even thinking. Peter said, you recall in Acts chapter 10 and verse 34, they've gone to Cornelius and they've uh, taught Cornelius and Cornelius I received the Holy Spirit and Peter came to a realization then. And that realization was, he said, I perceive, what you perceive, Peter, that God is no respecter of persons. So each and every one of us are going to have to obey the gospel. And nobody is going to get a privileged entrance into heaven. We're all going to have to do it exactly the same way. Jesus said in Luke 13, verse 27, he says, Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity, lawlessness. 
And of course, to claim to be serving God and to do it your way and to teach your things and your ideas is iniquity, it's lawlessness. Now we must learn to confirm, confirm, conform to the standard that God has set. To serve God, we must have scriptural authority for what we teach and what we practice. The judgment in the days of Noah and Sodom and Gomorrah shows clearly that God hates sin. And it's sin, as I said earlier on, that separates us from God. The price paid by those that sin reveals that God means what he says. We can take God's word at it, okay? He's demonstrated it to us. We need not suffer this, uh, this uh, uh, condemnation. He did not suffer. We have the gospel, the plan of salvation, presented to us through the scriptures. Let's commit ourselves to it, okay? Make a point of obeying it. You recall what happened in Acts chapter 2. You had Peter stand up and he preaches the first gospel sermon. And the Bible tells us that those people that stood there, some walked away, they weren't interested. But some of them stood there and they listened to what Peter had to say and they posed a question. In verse 37 they said, what shall we do? In verse 38 Peter told them, he says, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Now the Bible tells us that 3,000 souls obeyed the gospel. 3,000 souls accepted that invitation, okay? They realized it was important for them to get themselves right with God, and they obeyed the gospel. Now, we preach the same gospel message today. We can change it one iota. Are you prepared to do as those people done? Are you prepared to make this commitment? If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, repent and be baptized for your sins. If you're subject to the gospel in any way, won't you come forward now while together we stand and sing the final hymn?